Thank you. I will now uh, open up for uh, questions, and I'll ask you to uh, state your name and media outlet that you represent, uh, and uh, to whom you would like to ask the question. Please, sir. Uh, yeah, Adrian Croft from Reuters. A question for General Breedlove, please. What, what is your assessment, General, of the uh, military situation in eastern Ukraine at the moment? Has there been an increase in the number of Russian troops in eastern Ukraine? And can you confirm President Poroshenko's estimate that there are 9,000 Russian troops in eastern Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, Adrian, good to see you again. Thanks for being here. Um, the situation along the line of contact in Ukraine is not good. The fighting has intensified to essentially pre, uh, pre-agreement or pre-stand down levels, and in some cases uh, beyond. Um, the uh, I cannot, at this time, confirm President Poroshenko's numbers, but what we do see is that uh, the Russian-backed forces uh, have a renewed capability now to bring pressure on the Ukrainian forces and have, in several places, moved the line of contact to the west, um, and uh, this is uh, concerning. Um, as to our uh, vision into wh- what is going on as far as troops in the east now, Uh, What I can tell you is that we are beginning to see the signatures of air defense systems and electronic warfare systems that have accompanied past uh, Russian troop movements into Ukraine. Um, But we are unable at this moment to to confirm any specific number of Russian, additional Russian troops inside of eastern Ukraine. Ma'am? It will be almost follow-up of question of my colleague general here, Ukrainian news agency Union Irina Sommer. I would like to know if you did discuss a possible scenario of development on the ground and what can be possible reaction. Thank you. Uh, in uh, the, um, the first session which we had, which was situational awareness, we were briefed as to what uh, we believe is taking place on the ground for the time being. It was yesterday. Uh, And uh, we addressed uh, potential uh, developments which could unfold in the coming days so as to be able uh, to reflect uh, upon it during uh, the further discussions uh, which uh, took place among the chiefs. Uh, Regretfully, I cannot inform you as to which options uh, as to the possible development of events in eastern Ukraine. I regret I cannot discuss this uh, with you. Last question over there. Uh, Japanese Daily, my my name is Saito. Uh, I would like to ask uh, readiness action plan, uh, uh, especially a BJTF discussion. Uh, Could you elaborate uh, a little bit more? Uh, Did you agree some specific number of uh, BJTF or which country should take part in? And uh, the second question is, uh, uh, Mr. Bridger, uh, you said uh, uh, readiness action plan is uh, also against uh, non-state threat, a uh, non-five uh, uh, close uh, threat. So, uh, could you elaborate? Uh, uh, could you uh, could uh, this BJTF uh, uh, fight against uh, uh, such a terrorist attack uh, like uh, Islamic State? The first part of the question, which I've got it right, is uh, how you see the VJTF unfolding over time. Uh, indeed, we address this issue, and we will provide our recommendations, but I suggest we wait to the ministerials on 5 February uh, to provide any definitive information as to which rotation could be envisaged. I think, we have a, sorry. I think you said your name was Saito? Uh, Saito, thank you. I think it's also important to note, to answer uh, your second half of your question, but to add just a little bit to what the chairman said, it's important to note that the VJTF is just one part of the NRF. The focus of RAP is not just the VJTF. It is the entire NRF, and we have increased the readiness and responsiveness of the entire NRF, and the VJTF would be just one of the tools available to NATO and NATO requirements Uh, if there was an issue to address. And yes, uh, to your second part of your question, the VJTF will have inherent capabilities to deal with 
um, problems more than just Article 5. Um, and that's why it's important to note that there are air, land, sea, and special operations components to the VJTF. Question, second row. Hi, uh, Alexandra Mayer Hodal, right here with the German press agency DPA. Um, General Breedlove, just to follow up on Ukraine, uh, there are reports coming out of Donetsk airport uh, that uh, the Ukrainian troops might have abandoned it. Do you have any confirmation uh, of this or any reaction? And General Bartels, if I may, you mentioned that uh, NATO has a role to play in counterterrorism. Could you expand a bit? Are we talking about any concrete actions that NATO can take, or are we talking about you know, encouraging uh, allies to to exchange information. Thank you. Um, I cannot confirm that. Not to be glib, but we've been in meetings all morning long, and so today's news is is news to us at this moment. As to your second question, I would say NATO has a facilitator role in assisting nations in exchanging information uh, and whatever can be of, of use uh, for their respective. Uh, in addressing the respective situation in the respective countries. Ma'am? Terry Schultz with NPR and CBS. Um, to follow up on, on both of those questions, um, um, General Breedlove, uh, you, prior to the Ukraine crisis, you had a line of communication open with the Russians. Um, have you given any thought to maybe talking to General Gerasimov again and asking for... Uh, well, I don't know what you would ask him, actually, but um, uh, <laughs> um, have you? Uh, and, and because yesterday Lavrov said in a press conference that um, that he understood that there could possibly be some contact with NATO on the sidelines of a, a security conference, an international conference. Um, any? C could you follow up on that? Let us know if there really are signs that you're going to start a, start a conversation again, either you personally through your lines or with um, Secretary with Jen Stoltenberg, and also on the terrorism question. Um, if you, you mentioned the attacks inside our borders. There was enough information exchanged on these suspects to um, have them under surveillance at one point. So is, is NATO looking for other things it can do, even as national security is a, it remains in the, in, the, in the hands of national governments? What else can you do? You said that there are, you're fighting terror in many ways. As Alexander said, what are some of these other ways besides just exchanging information, which may already be uh, existent? Thank you. So, yes, we have talked an awful lot about how we reestablish calm and the fact that the communication with our, our senior military interlocutors in Russia is important. I did have a line of communication open. I, in fact, I, as I think I've reported to you at least once, I spoke to uh, uh, the general even after the uh, invasion of Crimea. And so um, we are going to reestablish that. We have talked among several of us senior military leaders how we'll do that. I will allow them to to roll out their plans as opposed to speak for them. But yes, we are going to reestablish communication with uh, Valerie. As to your second questions, um, I would like to remind you that uh, Operation Afghanistan ba started based upon this, the terrorist threats which came out of Afghanistan, and we've been addressing this now for over a decade, and by the way, are still addressing it as we are finalizing our operations in Afghanistan with the Resolute Support Mission. Uh, train, advise, and assist, as I mentioned. Uh, as to uh, events taking place within the borders uh, of the Allies, it is, uh, needless to say, a national responsibility. But in any way, we can facilitate uh, uh, either exchange of information or whatever can be used at the request of the nations. We, needless to say, address. Question there. Hi, uh, John Dahlberg from the Associated Press. Uh, for General Breedlove and uh, either of you two gentlemen, if you care to answer. Um, as you know, uh, the uh, Russia uh, last month adopted a new military doctrine that identified NATO as that country's number one military threat uh, and raised the possibility of a broader use of precision conventional weapons to deter foreign aggression. Um, could you tell me what NATO's assessment of the new Russian military doctrine is? Uh, whether NATO needs to take any actions in consequence, uh, and also uh, to the degree you can say what these precision conventional weapons that Russia claims to possess or be developing are. Thank you. Concerning the recently published 
uh, in the public um, public media uh, Russian uh, military doctrine. It is uh, partly a revision of the former uh, military doctrine, which was, if I remember right, was published in 2010, uh, and uh, emphasizes, uh, among others, some of uh, the actions which have taken place in relation to Ukraine. Um, we indeed uh, do assess it uh, and see which uh, repercussions uh, it will have and in the context of the rolling uh, adjustments of, uh, of uh, the military posture of the alliance uh, and in the discussion which we do with in cooperation between the, the chief of defense and the strategic commanders, uh, we have addressed the issue uh, of specifically of the uh, military doctrine, the Russian military doctrine and will continue to do so in, in the coming years. So if I could just, and I'll, I'll just put a punctuation point on that a little bit. Um, NATO is not a threat to Russia. Um, our goal is to reestablish uh, the norms uh, of conduct among nations here in Europe that uh, held for many years. Um, and we will work constructively uh, in ways to reestablish those norms where we respect international borders and we respect the sovereignty of nations. Um, and I unfortunately have uh, no insight right now into the precision capability that they're talking about. I think that we should read and, and pay attention to what they write. We find that the Russians do write about what they think that they might do. If I may add something in preparing the future, I think uh, we, what is important is uh, to study the doctrines, and, uh, but as well to compare the doctrine and the, uh, the capabilities which are behind that. Mm -hmm. And this is part of our, really of our job to look uh, forward in the future and to see what uh, could be the, what we call the game changers, which could really force or impede our actions or... Uh, uh, and, for, and, and push uh, and, and put pressure on our own uh, strategy. So I think it's absolutely crucial that we, we keep on uh, uh, studying that. But uh, we have our own doctrine, we, are our own, we have our own vision, and uh, I think the balance of force that we are trying to define should be able uh, to, to cope with any kind of evolution. This is our aim in a very defensive and a very peaceful matter, if I may, manner, if I may say so. We have still three questions uh, on the list, um, and there will be room for one more only. Uh, sir? Uh, uh, Jim Neuger from Bloomberg. A, a question about the VJTF. Uh, what will be the uh, response time of the interim VJTF? I, I seem to recall from Wales uh, talk of four, five, six days. Uh, and uh, the uh, targeted response time for the, the full VJTF once it's fully operational. Uh, Jim, thank you for the, that question. Um, the uh, initial um, readiness of all of the JTF forces in the future will be about seven days. We have agreed that if indications and warnings or intelligence call for um, a higher readiness, that we can reduce the readiness of those forces at, at those times when we see the indications that would call for it. Um, and I think, again, it just uh, allows me to sneak uh, a couple of points in, and that is remember that the VJTF is just one part of the larger NRF. We have increased the readiness of all the NRF, and those forces will also be in a situation that if we needed to see the indications and warning or intelligence that is required, we can lower their readiness and responsiveness as well. And two more questions, and then uh, we close the uh, list. Sir? Uh, Daniel Brössler, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Actually, I was to ask about response times as well. Uh, so I would, uh, would uh, ask about a more general question, uh, General Breedlove or General Bartels. Uh, uh, there was a lot of talk about hybrid warfare threats. Uh, uh, would you say that the alliance so far has done enough to prepare itself for scenarios like that? Uh, the interim will start off at seven days, and if we require, we can lower that responsiveness. I will, I will start by uh, responding, and eventually uh, General Breedlove uh, will pick up. 
uh, indeed, um, uh, we have uh, assessed carefully the dimensions of hybrid warfare, uh, which uh, I'm not so sure are that new, uh, but indeed it is a, a very fashionable word for the time being. Uh, and uh, what it primarily requires is a comprehensive approach. And I come back exactly to what uh, General Breedlove highlighted, uh, which is that the VJTF uh, is not standing alone. The whole readiness action plan and the alliance is capable of feeling, feeling those comprehensive capabilities which will be necessary to address a so-called hybrid warfare threat if such a one should develop against the allies. And I, I like the way that uh, General Bartles uh, said that because uh, we agree hybrid war is seems different. It's just a collection of what we have seen in other cases. And what makes it so special is that all we see uh, Russia using all the tools uh, at its availability uh, to affect pressure on a nation. And, and that's what makes it uh, a little tougher for us to address. And I would emphasize that, yes, we have been working on this. In fact, what I would say is that you would see um, a, a strong effort from NATO, a strong effort from some of our bilateral national relationships with some of the countries that are most at risk, and some multilateral efforts. Um, so... It's uh, been a pretty concerted effort from all uh, directions in NATO to begin to understand, characterize, build capacities, make sure that we're addressing the legal frameworks that are necessary in these ambiguous cases, et cetera, et cetera. And this work goes on. And the final question. I'm Alex Regard, working for Agence France Presse AFP. General Breedlove, if I may come back to what you said in the beginning about the situation in Ukraine. You said that you saw the signature of air defense systems and electronic war defense systems, and that these, these were there when there were massive numbers of troops in, in Ukraine a few months ago. Is that what, do I understand it right? And can you give us details? What do you mean? Are we talking about the famous book is uh, accused of, of having uh, sh shot at the Malaysian airplane? Are we talking, what types of, of systems do you see? And how, how, how are they manned? How many troops are you talking about when you say this? So the first thing, I would never use the word that you used, massive. That, that's not how I would characterize this, uh, the numbers of troops. Um, and what I uh, was uh, communicating to you is that uh, in two instances where we've had um, Russian troops across the border actively in eastern Ukraine, in both of those instances we had presence of certain types of air defense and other capabilities in uh, eastern Ukraine. And uh, um, I'm sorry I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to discuss the specific intelligence. But I will tell you that we see the same types of equipment, etc., in eastern Ukraine now. Thank you. That uh, completes the uh, press conference after the uh, Chief of Defense uh, meeting. Uh, I'd like to once again to draw your attention to the event page where you can find the pictures and uh, also the transcripts uh, of uh, the opening remarks and uh, questions uh, following it. Thank you for coming.